I hope everybody's doing okay today. It's nice to be here again. This is our second presentation. Uh, we did one in June and uh, um, both topics have been on full arch implants. For those of you who may or may not know me, I'm a prosthodontist in Rochester, New York, upstate New York. Um, I've been doing full arch for, geez, since 1991, believe it or not, when I was in my pros residency. And back in those days, we did our own lab work. And uh, I think I cast that metal framework out of gold, believe it or not, and uh, set some denture teeth and was off to the races. And, and uh, you know, you go back now over 30 years and doing full arch, uh, really it's been my passion. Those of, that, of those who know me know that, uh, that it is a large part of what I talk about, what I teach and what I do in my practice. Um, I, I must say that I do, um, I started a company called Highbridge Full Arch about 15, 16 years ago. And uh, we do education similar to what you're gonna see tonight on full arch. Um, so you're gonna get a you're gonna get a module really basically today about some of the philosophies on materials for full arch. But our company is really based on education. Uh, it gives uh, it gives dentists who want to do implant dentistry and full arch in particular the knowledge that they need, the foundation of knowledge that they need to uh, decide whether or not full arch is a is a journey they want to take, and if so, then you know learning it well and getting back to basics on prosthetics, and surgery, and really understanding the nuances of full arch is very important. Um, anyway, we also have a dental laboratory, and you're going to see some some work and or some pictures from from our hybrid laboratory, which which is really full arch only. And uh, a lot of what we've learned over the last 30 years has really been really sort of come out of doing a lot of full arch um, and sort of tweaking what we're doing based on what we see clinically over time. And that's, I think those of us who practice dentistry know that it really is a bit of a feedback uh, and a loop on what works and what doesn't. So. You're going to get 30 years of experience here. Um, the lecture from June that I gave on avoiding the obstacles for success in your full arch journey. Um, if you want to go back after tonight and you like what you heard and you didn't see this one, this really is um, this is sort of all the things that you should sort of be aware of and and be sort of cognizant of as you're starting your full arch journey. So. Feel free to, to go back uh, within Catapult Education and go back and sort of take a look at this lecture, um, which uh, I think you'll enjoy. So like any good lecture, we'll talk about learning objectives and uh, we'll start with uh, reviewing requirements for the full arch prosthetic design. And you, know, you see this picture of what, a, what the prosthetic design looks like. And uh, it's a screw retained implant supported fixed restoration, implant supported restoration. It's a very specific kind of restoration. Um, back in the day, we called it a hybrid bridge. But what are the things that you need to kind of plan for if you're going to use this sort of a prosthetic design? Um, let's also obviously focus tonight on the materials that are available out there in the marketplace. And, if you're like what I see come across my desk these days and what's online, there's a lot of different things out there. There's a lot of materials being touted. Some of them already come and gone. Um, a couple of those I, I've included in the presentation just because I think it's interesting. Um, and I can tell you why I knew those, those materials wouldn't last when I, when I saw them and evaluated them. So, uh, but there are a lot of different materials that, you, that you're gonna have to choose from. Um, as you're doing your cases and uh, and uh, uh, look at the pros and cons for all of those, you're going to see that no, no material at, in full arch is perfect and all of them have, have many different advantages and disadvantages. And then, you know, going back to, you know, 
um, avoiding the obstacles of success. You know, I, ultimately in that lecture from June, a big part of it was really patient satisfaction. You know, doing these cases and uh, thinking you did a great job, only to come to find out the patient's not happy. Um, I can tell you that materials play a very large role in patient satisfaction. And so um, we're gonna really talk about that a little bit. So uh, things to consider relative to prosthetic design. Um, I think um, inter-arch space um, is something that um, is really um, often um, discussed in training. Cantilever length is important. This type of prosthetic design, by the way, uh, is usually cantilevered. Um, it is a screw retained restoration. So where are those screw holes? And ultimately, how do patients take care of a fixed restoration, especially a bridge on implants? And we'll talk a little bit about how, why I think hygiene access. I didn't really think about it all that much 30 years ago, but I can tell you after doing it for as long as I've done it, um, you, really, you really need to make sure that the patient really understands how to take care of these things. So um, let's talk about inter inner arch space. Um, you know, when you're, when you're working with a dentate patient and uh, they're fully dentate and they haven't lost any bone, you know, the big question is, well, you know, how much bone reduction do I need to do at the time of extraction to create enough interarch space that I can do this prosthetic design? And the easy answer to this whole conversation is you need five millimeters minimum of additional space, five millimeters. You know, if you look at this picture and you look at the actual tooth part of it, let me see if I can highlight it here. Um, and, um, you know, if, if this was, if, if the tooth itself um, uh, had no recession and all you did was take out the tooth, well, you you don't have any room for that extra material that you see apical to it. So that's that extra five millimeters. You'll see that below it, there's a there's a there's a tooth coming up. And really, we always measure interarch space not from the incisal edge in the anterior, but really from the opposing tooth. And so as that lower incisor comes up and hits the cingulum of that upper anterior tooth, that's the start of interarch space. And it extends all the way up to the soft tissue. And in this case, it's the, it's the platform of the implant or of the abutment. Um, and so the bone level then is three millimeters apical to that. So typically, if you have five millimeters of clinical crown height from the opposing tooth to the soft tissue, and then you have another five millimeters of additional bone reduction, when you're all done, you should have a minimum of 10 millimeters of interarch space measured from the opposing tooth. If, if you're in the posterior, obviously the occlusal contact or the opposing tooth is hitting the occlusal surface. So that measurement of 10 millimeters of interarch space or the total prosthetic space required um, is based on the occlusal surface all the way to the soft tissue. So I hope that helps, but um, that's a minimum. And if you, if you talk to any of my dental technicians, they're going to tell you, if you can give me 12 millimeters or more, uh, the restoration becomes stronger. It has better embrasures. It has thicker materials. It only gets better with more space, which is sort of against most people's thinking because a lot of people aren't used to taking bone away. They think bone loss is bad. And in fact, with prosthetics, bone loss uh, or bone reduction tends to be actually beneficial to the prosthetic longevity. Uh, the second uh, consideration relative to um, um, this is the cantilever length. And, you know, as you look at these restorations, um, these, these full arch restorations, the way that we do them in Highbridge, we typically use six implants in the maxilla between the sinuses. And we use uh, five implants on the mandible and the symphysis between the mental foramen. Um, and so in the premaxilla on the upper and the symphysis on the lower, we then take the real estate that the patient gives us typically. And then we cantilever back to the first molar. 
And typically that distal, that A and F implant on the upper or the A and E implant on the lower is usually coming out somewhere in that first premolar area, which means that normally we're cantilevering two teeth. So cantilevers, obviously, the biomechanical you know, issue that's created by a cantilever really creates stress and strain and therefore prosthetics and materials do matter. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today, really, when we talk about durability, especially in the posterior, not in the anterior, you're never going to break one of these prostheses between an implant and another implant. You're always going to have fatigue on the cantilever. So a lot of our conversation tonight is going to be about that. So uh, as we look at this A through F on the upper and the symphysis and the uh, premaxilla and A through E on the symphysis on the lower, we try to control the cantilever length and we try to maximize the interarch space or the total prosthetic space, which is the which is the thickness of this rectangle. And so the 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 shorter the cantilever and the thicker the rectangle or the prosthesis, obviously the less likelihood that you're going to have any sort of a fatigue or a fracture. And so if that, if that interarch space gets narrow, even with the same cantilever length, then what you're going to find is that you're going to have an increased likelihood of flexure and or fracture. And uh, we found this happened often in our early days. In the, uh, in the early 2000s, when we were using different materials and we had different concepts, um, a bone reduction um, amount, um, we ended up having a lot of cases where we had fracture in that distal most implant. And uh, those are great liabilities in a practice. Those are unbelievable liabilities. And, uh, and those of you who have, who have had things that you've done in your practice, that it took a couple of years to figure out it wasn't the right thing to do. Understand that that if you're if you worry about your reputation and you worry about the patient satisfaction, then you got to make right by that. So a lot of what I'm telling you tonight is really based on mistakes. I have to say, and maybe not mistakes we thought we were making. Uh, we always thought we were doing the right thing, but definitely as we look back on it, we wish we did a couple other things over the years. So typically a fracture usually occurs at the center of the terminal abutment. And again, um, whether it's the cantilevers are too long uh, or it's the wrong material, that really is going to be the key spot right there. So the concern for excessive cantilever length is not so much, in my opinion anyway, the risk of implant failure. I, I really don't believe that excessive cantilevers have a direct correlation oftentimes with bone loss or implant loss. And that sounds crazy, but I think that there's a lot of advantage to splinting and cross arch stabilization that you see that breaks a lot of the rules that we normally follow when it comes to implant dentistry and we get away with it. But what you don't get away with, unfortunately, is fatigue of materials. And you know, you think about cycles, and you know, you know how many you know chewing cycles per day, per week, per month, per year. Multiply that by ten years. Eventually, things get weak, and these materials are, are attached to implants that don't move. You've got a very unforgiving system here with a full arch. So um, things do fatigue, and you need to understand that, and you need to build these restorations in a way that is gonna give you the greatest chance of success long-term. So screw hole position, you know, not really a, a big deal, except we know that if the screw holes are going through teeth, those teeth are weak. And so keep the screw holes away from where the teeth are. Usually it's in the cingulum area and the lingual area. You don't want them in the tongue space though. If you go too far palatal or too far lingual and your implant angulation is wrong, and, and you, you err on the side of getting your screw holes out of the way of the teeth, then you're gonna have issues with tongue space and phonetics and, and things that really irritate your patients. So um, I think you really have to be, be almost like, you gotta know right where the teeth are gonna be. You gotta put the implants right where they need to be, right at the right angulation. 
We do that a lot with guided surgery these days. Everything that we do is deliberate. Um, we do all of our CBCT and guided surgery and our guides and our implant screw hole position is where we want it to be. So very important. And then hygiene access, um, you know, hygiene access is one of those things that as I look back over 30 years and I look at the cases that ended up not doing well, um, and I'll just say hygienically and or bacterially, bone loss. Um, there was a day, by the way, that I used to tell patients um, that them having periodontal disease um, typically it does not correlate to bone loss around implants. And I do think to some degree that comment is true. Um, obviously, a lot of our patients lose their teeth because of periodontal disease. And a very high percentage of those implants that we put on those patients do well, 95, 98% success over 10 years. So, so really, I would say, generally speaking, that comment is true, except that there are things that layer on top of one another. Risk factors do layer. And the more risk factors there are in a patient, the greater the chance that you're going to see like a peri-implantitis. And I think hygiene on top of other risk factors, poor hygiene, if you put it on top of somebody who smokes or somebody who's a diabetic or some, you know, these things just sort of exponentially increase the risk of a patient. So you're going to find that you're going to have patients who have bone loss after five, seven years. And when you take these prostheses off, you're going to see just the underside there's going to be just an amazing amount of plaque that has been caking around these implants because the patient hasn't been able to keep them clean. So being able to customize the accessibility, the hygiene accessibility, the intaglio of these restorations should be um, created in a way that they can be customized. And again, if we're talking about materials, the materials should be customizable. This is going to be one of those criteria where you, you have to be able to adjust. And I just did a case today where I went in and I actually delivered and, and I needed to open up three or four of these in-betweens uh, um, so that the patient could get in with a floss threader. And so being able to modify is important, making sure that the surface is convex and not concave. Uh, is very important. This is a bridge, and a lot of people think it's it's denture-like. It's it's really not. There's some similarities in the materials, but what I have to say is that you know, as you look at as you look at the the underside, you should be very critical that these surfaces uh, are convex, and that there is there isn't what I call a well or a, a ridge lap on the facial, you know, a lot of times the labs want to wax these up in a way where there's like a, like an overlap that goes apical to where this connects to the implant. That's the kiss of death. These areas just becomes caked with, with plaque over time. That plaque gets into the sulcus around the implant. And then over time, it, it once you get a little bone loss around one of these implants, the patient's done. That, that implant is a slow fail. Um, so embrasures should be, um, I would say, generous. Um, the patient should be able to lift the lip up, uh, see that embrasure, and be able to access it. And so, again, um, we want to make sure that we can add material or subtract material based on the manual dexterity, the accessibility, where the tissue is. So materials, again, going back to the title of this lecture, Materials do matter because you need to be able to adjust them. And it does correlate to implant success, in my opinion. Um, this woman, by the way, uh, I finished today. I just, uh, I actually, um, I, she was my afternoon patient. And of course, she was top of mind. And I said, oh, I got to give this lecture tonight. So um, as I was doing her case, I was, I was sort of conscious about all these little things that I was doing for her. But at the end of the day, she needs to be happy. Patient satisfaction is going to be defined by these materials. 
And these materials are variable. And you'll see here, this, this is our hybrid generation four combination of materials. And um, we have changed these materials. It's, there's four generations. You would think there's only four different combination of materials that we've used. I can tell you there's probably more like seven because there were some real slight modifications along the way. But our generation four materials were deliberate with what we use. We know what else is out there and we, and we have a really good rationale for why we use them. And that's gonna be a little bit of, uh, it's gonna be most of what we talk about today. So here's my, my new girlfriend, Linda. And, uh, and uh, again, uh, true, true success with her is that 10 days from now when she comes back for her final photos, her hygiene instructions and final x-rays, she comes back and she still likes us. So, so 10 days, she's gonna come back and she's gonna, she was told by the way, that there, are, there may be things that we need to be adjusted. She was given every, every um, um, insight that just because she's finished today doesn't mean she's done. And so making sure you're transparent about the fact that there are cases where you got to get the bugs out. You got to make adjustments. She might be biting her cheek, her lip. She might have a little whistle. She might, I might need to give her more access underneath. These are all adjustable things if the material choices are correct. So in my opinion, these full arch restorations should have uh, certain criteria, one of which is, is, is that, as I said, these materials should be modifiable. They should be adjustable. You should be able to grind on them, reshape them, and polish them, and have them polish as though it, they, were, they came right out of the lab. And so whether you're modifying the teeth, whether you're modifying the pink mask or the gingival mask, um, um, you need to be able to um, you need to be able to adjust easily. They should be forgiving, and you know, keep in mind that this is these are not this is not being supported on teeth that have a periodontal ligament. These implants are ankylosed; they don't move. There's there's great rigidity there. Um, there's multiple implants, and so when you screw these things on, it is a rigid system. And so you need to be careful that you're not putting on a rigid material. You would think, oh, I'm gonna put the strongest material that I can possibly think of on here, but that combination is really some, oftentimes very um, uh, sort of detrimental to the system itself. So the, like the, the materials, this hybrid generation four is a very forgiving material. It has a very good percussive feel. And um, the, the core of this should be completely rigid. It should not flex um, because if it does flex and if it's not completely rigid, you're gonna have a delamination of materials on, on the outside. Um, Cost-effective, that's just my philosophy. I mean, my feeling on these full arch restorations is, is that we're doing, a, we're doing a service in the community to a certain degree. And it's, it's always been my goal for the last 20, 30 years to be able to treat as many patients as we possibly can and give them the blessing of tooth replacement. Um, obviously, uh, I'm also a businessman, so I, I want to make sure that not only um, am I giving them good quality, but it has to be um, very cost effective for the patient. And, and I think that holds true uh, in most markets. Um, these should be replaceable. Um, there's nothing better than, you know, 10, 15 years later when um, the restoration is a bit haggard and you just have to just be honest with patients. Nothing lasts forever. And if this restoration were to need to be replaced, it literally is a computer file. It's that easy to replace. I could literally order it, and in a matter of days, I can have a brand new identical restoration fabricated that was made 10, 15 years ago, and I can introduce it to the patient, uh, swap them out, and we can do that very cost-effectively for the patient. 
So again, not, no material that I'm going to talk about tonight is perfect. Um, there is a balance of pros and cons or advantages and disadvantages. And I think you've got to just really understand what's the cause and effect of the decisions that you're going to make. Those of you who have already done full arch and done a lot of it have great insight as to what the pitfalls are. And if you've been doing it for five years instead of one year, you've learned even more. And if you've done it for 10 or 15 years, you've learned even more. So, so time really is the thing that is going to teach you um, um, what, uh, what material is the best material. Or you can work all day and then uh, watch my lecture after work like you are today. So um, how we got to now, uh, I don't know how many people have read this book. Um, I don't read a lot of books, um, but this book is, is probably my favorite. And the reason why I bring it up is because it really kind of takes you through six different innovations in the modern world. I'll just give you a couple of examples. One of them is glass. Another one of them is uh, refrigeration. And another one is clean. Um, and these uh, six things that they go through, they basically take you, for example, with, with glass, how glass was created uh, back in the, you know, you know, 800 BC became uh, spectacles um, and it turned out late years later into TV and then computers and then internet. And, and you know, at the end of the day, um, we use glass in computer uh, circuits and whatnot in, uh, in our dental lab, in our dental offices. And that's how we do these restorations. Um, I could draw a parallel here to, to how we got to now, because what you're looking at here are the original hybrid restorations back 20, 25 years ago. And you'll see on the left, you see this, this well, it's a horrible looking model. It's the only picture I could find of, of an old titanium laser welded are. We used to laser weld stock titanium together, wrap it in acrylic, put some denture teeth on it. We would say a little prayer and the patient would go off. And, and these things were like, these things would ex literally explode after like three years, three, four years. They would delaminate, uh, they would crack, they would break, the cantilevers would, would snap off. And anyway, again, if you're going to be an early adopter like we were 30 years ago and you were using the materials that were available and, and we had limited knowledge and limited experience, um, anyway, it didn't take us long to find out that this was a liability. Um, but this was the start, really. This, this, this is what a lot of people did. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of good dentists did these restorations. And then when they started to fail, um, they um, they either got out of it completely. I've talked to many prosthodontists that were that were doing these in the '90s and in the 2000s, and and um, and they got away from it. They never went back. And they they still to this day they think, oh, these hybrid full arch restorations are garbage. Um, not not true. Obviously, we're not using these same materials, but they taught us a lot, and they taught us about what these materials had to be in order to be successful. So uh, a lot of the market transitioned in one fell swoop over to zirconia. Um, and zirconia, monolithic zirconia restorations, um, uh, there was the pretile material back probably 15 years ago, and it was all the rage. And you know, I, I have to say that we, we did jump in a little bit on that. Uh, we, 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 we still actually have zirconia in our laboratory and we do, we do probably 2% of our restorations are ordered as zirconia, but most, most people, uh, find these restorations very challenging. And what I would say is that probably seven, eight could even be 10 years ago now at the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, I gave a lecture on full arch. And I talked about zirconia and I said, I made a prediction. Uh, I said, uh, I said, in my opinion, in five years, most people will, will have found out that zirconia full arch 
uh, this material is not indicated for full arch and I think zirconia will be a thing in the past. Well, clearly I was wrong, but I still have the same opinion. Um, I do think that zirconia is ill. Uh, well, it's, it's really not indicated. It's got a lot of things about it that make it probably not the right material for me at least. And I know a lot of doctors that, that we work with around the country uh, come to find out have had the same experience that I have had. So um, uh, that's why they, you know, I'm definitely have been in the minority on this, these monolithic materials. But anyway, I want to just talk about the difference between when we talk about prosthetic design and on these restorations, there's two basic ways that you can make these restorations. You can do them with one monolithic material. And most people, again, use monolithic zirconia, and that's it. They mill it out of a puck. They cement some uh, titanium uh, abutments within it, and they screw it onto the implants. I would say that relative to this material, these, these materials have gotten more aesthetic. But really, you know, 10 years ago, they, they were quite ugly. Um, then there's laminated materials. And I think little by little, the industry has, has, has kind of gone over, almost gone back to the laminated prosthetic design, which includes a toothpiece, which is fused to a substructure of some sort. And so there's different materials for the toothpiece and there's different materials for the substructure. But uh, we'll probably spend a little bit more time tonight on all of the variations of the laminated full arch restorations, because I think most of us know a bit about the monolithic zirconias that are out there. And um, when we look at a generation four, again, we're looking at these laminated materials of the toothpiece bonded to the substructure. And then there's a gingival mask that encapsulates most of that substructure and binds it all together. Um, and so that's sort of the idea with the laminated restoration. And so as we look at the substructure, you know, ideally between the implants, you know, you don't need huge amounts of, of, of material between the implants, but on the cantilever portion of these, and this doesn't really show much of a cantilever, but you really do need to have some, some strength on that last implant. And, you know, and again, if we look at this, um, it should it should support the materials that are going to be bonded to it uh, very effectively. And on the on the toothpiece, that toothpiece again is designed. Um, actually, the, the substructure is designed after you know where the teeth go. So in fact, um, you're retrofitting the substructure to accommodate where the teeth are going to be. That's why it's so important to really know where teeth are going to be in space. Um, before you start to make your, your substructure. Um, so what are the substructure options? Um, we're we're going to talk about um, four of them, really. Um, titanium, um, back 15 years ago, 20 years ago, titanium was the only material besides gold that anybody would ever use and attach to a dental implant. And the thought, for those of you who are too young to remember, but the thought was that if you put dislike materials, uh, a different kind of metal on top of a titanium implant, that you would create a galvanic reaction and create some sort of a, a negative effect on the implants. Well, um, I have to say, um, we were the first laboratory and or doctors, I believe, out there that decided to take the chance. And we did see some, some research that, that said, chrome cobalt would be perfectly fine on dental implants. But titanium, the issue with titanium is it's really not a metal to, it doesn't have any of the characteristics of, of a really superior substructure. And we're, we'll talk about flexure strength and, um, and actually tensile strength and hardness and all that stuff. But, but titanium just doesn't have it. Chrome cobalt, uh, which is what we use, has much better characteristics as it relates to strength and durability over time. Um, when you look at 
chrome cobalt versus titanium and you compare it to its Vickers hardness, its ultimate tensile strength, and its elongation, um, you'll see that in all three categories, chrome cobalt just completely dominates by two times at least um, what the titanium substructure is. And so without a doubt, chrome cobalt is, is the better material. Um, the other thing in is, is that chrome cobalt, you can actually bond, chemically bond to chrome cobalt. You can't bond to titanium um, with any of the materials that you're gonna be hoping to bond to. So that's one of the other things is, is chrome cobalt also has a really nice advantage relative to the bonding. Um, as we look at uh, frames with high yield and high tensile strengths, they're, they're, they're normally strong and stiff. They don't flex, they don't break. Um, um, you can thin them out really good, uh, especially in the lingual and in the palatal contours. And again, the big advantage here, especially if you're like us, where we live with the anatomy between the sinuses and the mental foramen, that's where our good real estate for bone is. We're gonna cantilever back to first molars whenever we can. We really wanna make sure that our cantilevers are strong, or as strong as they can be. And um, uh, the Vickers hardness, that's the surface texture and uh, elongation. Uh, this makes it polishable, um, non-reactive, resists scratching, um, uh, minimizes plaque formation, and really ultimately creates a longer lasting prosthesis. So, so chrome cobalt um, also um, wins in all of those categories. Um, probably 10 years ago or more, Peak and Trilor came out. And I remember reading all about, all about these materials. And the first thing I said was, seems like a pencil to me. And basically what I was saying is, is that these, these materials, although somewhat rigid, have very low strength. And because they don't bend, they break. And so although it's, they're perfectly fine um, for connecting things together, like you see here, uh, these materials are not really designed to support teeth like you need to support them with the substructure and you're, they're really not indicated for cantilevering. Um, so, you know, as you look at these, these are really sort of new age materials, perfectly good for other indications in my opinion. Um, and when you look at Trilor and actually Pectin and Peak, you, know, you look at the tensile strengths, very, very low. Um, and um, the elongation is very low. And when you have low strength and low elongation, just think brittle. And again, um, you know, in dentistry, I always use the number two pencil as an example for a lot of things. But if you take a number two pencil, which is a laminated cylinder, right? It's, it, you've laminated, you've got, the, you've, you've got the lead itself, then you've got the wood, then you've got the paint, but these things are all bound together. But if you flex this thing a hundred times or a thousand times, it's point of flexure. Little by little, what happens to that, that yellow paint, right? It starts to crack a little bit, and then it starts to chip a little bit. And before you know it, you got a bald spot where the paint used to be. And then the, and then the wood starts to crack and break. And then you start to see that there's, a, there's an indentation there. So flexure is really what you're trying to avoid relative to laminated materials. And... Um, and now we're going to talk about what, what are the options. So we talked about titanium from cobalt and these other new age materials for the substructure. Let's talk about the toothpiece materials. And, you know, there are apparently, uh, and it surprises me, there's a lot of folks out there still using denture teeth processed onto a substructure. This was obviously our generation one prosthesis. This is what we used to do back in the day. But um, these individual denture teeth, um, um, that's why we call it a hybrid bridge, actually. But the advantages are they're soft. They, they, they have a very good percussive feel. There's a good give to the prosthesis. We always knew that. 
Um, you can use conventional laboratory technique, meaning that with these denture teeth, you don't need to have CAD CAM in your laboratory to do them. So, so a lot of laboratories still use denture teeth because it keeps them in, in, in the area of laboratory technology that they feel comfortable with. And I think that's a big advantage. They are modifiable, which is a, one of the things that I was talking about. Um, they're easily repaired. Um, if, if you have a chip, a break, or a tooth that falls off, anything can be put back on, oftentimes without even removing it from the mouth. And uh, believe it or not, these restorations, especially the denture teeth today, they're very aesthetic. Um, and, um, and although they're not, they have some disadvantages, one of the disadvantages is not uh, their aesthetics. But the disadvantages are obviously wearability over time, incisal strength, uh, chipping, breaking. Uh, acrylic processing is very technique sensitive. And in particular, with these denture teeth, when you're processing denture teeth onto a bar and you're getting the, the injected uh, acrylic, uh, the acrylic and the denture tooth have to bond perfectly, chemically bond perfectly in order to get um, uh, something that is one piece. Um, and oftentimes, having done this for many years, it takes nothing to get a little bit of residue on those denture teeth and create a, um, a processing error where you don't actually get full bonding of the pink acrylic to the tooth itself. So that to me is probably one of the biggest disadvantages. Um, the materials that we use are these highly cross-linked milled, um, milled PMMA materials, the polymethyl methacrylate acrylic. And these have gotten to be very, very strong, very dense. Um, just even going back six, seven years, there's a huge difference in the materials today than even five years ago. But um, these materials are milled. Um, so this is a subtractive uh, milling. Um, these, these are CAD um, designed and milled manufactured, and um, they tend to, you can design them however you want. So you got great flexibility and tooth setup. So very much like a digital denture technique, but for full arch, um, you get the advantages of percussive feel. Um, you are in, uh, in the CAD cam realm, which is very advantageous, especially these days. They're customizable, meaning you can actually, not only can you customize tooth position, but you can customize tooth shape and thickness. And in a lot of these cases, we can take a library for these teeth and we can actually make them even stronger by adding additional contour and strength, especially incisally. So one of the disadvantages to these cross-link materials are incisal strength. And one of the advantages is you can modify these teeth and make them stronger. Um, and so um, one of the advantages is their strength of a monolithic structure. So individual teeth that are bonded in onto a full arch versus one, one large tooth piece, all monolithic material bonded to a substructure, much stronger than individual teeth. They're modifiable and they're repairable and replaceable. You know, I tell my patients that if 10, 15 years down the road, the toothpiece has worn, but the framework, the substructure is going to be perfect, um, we can just remill the toothpiece and like changing the tires on your car, you can take one toothpiece off and you can put another toothpiece on and reprocess it and you have a brand new restoration. So very repairable, very re replaceable. Um, so a lot of advantages to this material and highly aesthetic. Disadvantage, disadvantages relative to, to the ceramic materials is wear resistance. And, you know, what I would say is that, is that, you know, when we talk about some of these ceramics like zirconia, the comment I always tell my patients, I mean, literally, you could get run over by a tractor trailer, completely crushed. And the only thing that survives is your set, is, is your set of teeth made out of zirconia, probably not even a chip. So, these teeth, you know, zirconia has that advantage, but you have all these advantages with, and again, this is the balancing act, all of these advantages with these milled PMMAs, but wear resistance over time, 
and size or strength if not designed well are the two big disadvantages. Um, we've also um, tried nano ceramic hybrid materials, also comes in a puck, also has to be milled. Um, these, these materials have more ceramic in them, so they're harder. Um, but the advantages are they are more wear resistant. Uh, they, they still, although they're not nearly as soft as a PMMA, they do, they are softer than a zirconia restoration. So less stress and strain on the implants and on the connection. Um, they're modifiable. They're highly aesthetic. Uh, the disadvantages to the nano ceramics are inferior bond strength. Uh, they don't nearly bond as well to the substructure and or to the gingival mask. And if you can't get the gingival mask, which is the pink part, to chemically bond against the toothpiece, what you're going to find long term is you're going to find that at that gingival margin, you're going to see micro leakage. You're going to see staining, really ugly staining at the gingival mask against that. So, so that's something to consider is that is that you know everything has its disadvantages. The cases that I've seen where we've tried to bond onto that, they don't look so good after a few years. Um, and the delamination factor is, is a little bit of an issue because of the bond strength issue. Um, and these materials, like a lot of things are technique sensitive and you need to make sure that, that you're, um, that you're um, using them correctly. Um, and then lastly, as we look at materials, we'll talk about zirconia. Um, wear resistance, of course, size of strength, uh, you're, you're never going to chip monolithic zirconia. Disadvantages are it's, you can't modify them. You, you, you can't customize them intraorally, which is my um, one of my big things. Um, it's, they're technique sensitive. Uh, any laboratory that does zirconia will tell you that when zirconia is milled, it's milled out of what's called a green a green state or green stick. It's that puck is just compressed powder and it's a little bit like chalk. So once it's milled, it has to be handled uh, very carefully uh, until it's sintered. And if you can mill it and handle it and, and recontour it and stain it and then sinter it without straining the zirconia in its green state, then it'll center and it'll give you the intended strength. But if you've ever had a zirconia restoration that cracked or broke right through a very large area, that was that was an issue with the technique. It didn't actually center. There was a there was a there was a strain in that green state, uh, and that I have found is even in our laboratory, that is a really big liability in any laboratory is that issue. Um, Low bond strength, um, these, these materials, if you're using the zirconia as a toothpiece and you're bonding it onto a substructure, um, which a lot of folks are doing, they're trying to get the strength in the cantilevers and they're trying to get the advantage of a thinner lingual or palatal surface, um, be, um, then what they do is they try to bond it on there and it doesn't have very good bond strength. You can't really bond a zirconia toothpaste piece effectively onto a substructure. And the micro leakage thing, again, if you're using the zirconia as a toothpiece and you're using a gingival mask of some sort, typically it's some sort of a composite material like, a, uh, well, I can't think of it on top of my head. It's that composite mask. Um, that material will not chemically bond and therefore you will get micro leakage at the gingival margins. It'll look wonderful in its first six months. Um, and again, uh, the intaglio, depending on what materials you're using, should be adjustable. And a lot of times these materials, I've seen them, sometimes it's the zirconia toothpiece on a metal substructure where the intaglio is metal and that's not adjustable. So that could be problematic. This good looking fella is Jay Sober. Jay is our lab director. He's in charge of a lot of the a lot of the materials and a lot of the technology in our laboratory. And one of the reasons why I wanted to show Jay's picture is because there's a lot of science to what's going on in the dental world these days. And it's the science 
that has to be that has to support uh, what we do, and what we do obviously is going to either be a benefit or a liability to our practice. And again, it's really important that what you put in the mouth is going to be there and be predictable. Um, our uh, our phrase at Highbridge is a simple way to a lasting smile, and the simple way is our technique. The lasting smile, though, is the prosthesis. And patients expect longevity and they don't want the headaches. The whole idea behind taking teeth out is and replacing them with implants and these restorations is that they are supposed to be long lasting. And you really need to be careful relative to, to that. I want to I wanna talk about the materials of a generation four hybrid real quick. Um, this is a question that comes up a lot relative to um, all the other materials that are available on the market these days, primarily zirconia or crystal ultra or whatever. So this is a milled PMMA. It's a double cross linked um, acrylic that is milled out of a puck. And this acrylic happens to be an Ivoclar material, very dense, very strong and wear resistant. But at the end of the day, it is acrylic. It's not a ceramic. This is an Ivo cap injected acrylic so the mask is also a pmma it's the fact that it's injected gives it a really dense antibacterial surface much different than most processed acrylics the, the reason why we use this acrylic with this acrylic is because there's a chemical bond between these two surfaces the thing about using two dissimilar materials is that Oftentimes you don't actually get a true chemical bond. You can use adhesives like some of these other composite materials that are used. When they're put against an acrylic, there isn't a chemical bond. And over time, what you'll see is a micro leakage around, around the necks of these. And so we don't use a, a gingival mask of composite. We use a gingival mask of acrylic because it's like material. And let's talk about the substructure for a minute. The substructure is, is a chrome cobalt material. And, you, and I refer to this right here as the metal apron. And you'll see that this thickness is only as thick as it needs to be to house the actual shoes. And as we go ahead and we'll just show you what that looks like when we do an intraoral cementation, we're able to pick up a FDA approved surface in a chrome cobalt framework that is perfectly passive. That really is a lot of the advantages of a Gen 4 is that, is that the surface isn't a milled surface, it's not a printed surface, it's actually a FDA approved part that is accurate to the implant that it's intended to go on. And so that's a huge advantage rather than trying to create a framework that has somehow been milled and or printed that is supposed to fit passively on all of the implants. And that framework not only gives you a very thin, either palatal apron, or in the case of the lower, a very thin lingual apron, and the tongue space does matter. Number one complaint of a patient will be that the tongue space has been in, encroached upon. And in both of these situations, we're able to keep that to its, its minimum thickness. If this was any other material, and I'll just use zirconia as an example, zirconia has to be at least two to three times as thick in order for it to retain the same titanium abutments without breaking through over time. So we have increased strength where it matters, and that strength also allows us to polish and thin this as much as possible. And at the same time, although this case doesn't show it, this case has a, not quite a two tooth cantilever, but we can cantilever two to two and a half teeth. So even if this last implant was in this first premolar area, we could cantilever all the way to the first molar, not have to worry about sinus augmentation or sinus grafting, get the patient 12 teeth, keep the keeping things nice and simple. If this was zirconia, again, zirconia is the strongest material out there. The problem with zirconia is, is that if you, if you make it strong where it wants to flex here, you're making it super thick. And if you're making it thin so the patient doesn't get offended by it, 
this is where it's going to break. So zirconia does crack, it does break, and it usually breaks right through this thinnest area of a cantilever. So you can cantilever longer with the Generation 4 hybrid than you can with a zirconia restoration. Another big advantage. And then lastly, and I could probably go on forever, when we're talking about percussive feel, the feel of these teeth in the mouth is much more tooth-like than it is if these were ceramic materials. That clankiness, that heaviness of a zirconia restoration is really a big disadvantage to those materials. So we also have a better feel. We have a more natural wearability of these materials. You know, even natural teeth wear. Um, these teeth can wear over time, but if they can't wear, then the stress of that function gets transferred to either the shoe, um, and again, I call this a shoe, but you know, if you think about it, um, this shoe cemented within metal is a metal on metal bond, which is a much stronger bond than a metal on zirconia bond. So if this was a zirconia restoration, this bond strength would be a fraction of the bond strength that it's gonna be on this patient. And so when you go ahead and you come back to the wearability of these teeth and the stress and strain on the teeth, what you'll find is that, is that the stress and strain, and if you consider that to be a cycling effect over, over years, uh, what you'll find is that in zirconia, these titanium abutments or shoes will oftentimes debond within a zirconia restoration at a much higher rate than they would ever debond on a metal to metal sandblasted surface that has been properly um, cemented. So I have the adjustability of these teeth, not only to get my centric stops once I deliver, but also to get my excursions. And if for some reason after I deliver, I find out that I can't thread through here easily enough, which means that Lisa won't be able to thread through here, then really what we have to do is take it out, customize the intaglio of the surface and make sure that the patient can actually get in there easily. Flip side of that is that if you actually have a case where, where the, the soft tissue has changed and you have too much space under there, what's beautiful about these materials, and again, it's a balancing act of, of materials, um, is I can add to this. I can actually take this out. I can sandblast and clean the surface and I can get what is the equivalent of a, of a composite mask material, sandblast it, use the adhesive, and add a little bit of contact so that if she's got air escaping somewhere, I can add to it. Can't do that with zirconia, and that is also a big negative of zirconia and a big positive of our Generation 4 materials. And lastly, you know, we've talked about at least six or seven advantages of the Gen 4, there is one disadvantage, and that is these teeth are not as strong as zirconia. And in particular, she's never gonna chip these teeth or wear these teeth except on the incisal edges. So really, in essence, there are six upper incisal edges that thin out, and these thinner areas are, are the only area that could possibly chip. You're never gonna chip something back here. We overcompensate and we add a little bit of material thickness here to resist those fractures. But at the end of the day, when you have an upper and a lower, um, and these do not move, there is no, there is no proprioception, there, there, is no, um, there is no ligament that makes them move, you are gonna have more wear and or chipping of the incisal edges on a Gen 4 than you will on a Zirconia. So in fact, there's one disadvantage to the Gen 4, and there's, I could probably tell you, eight or 10 advantages uh, advantages of the Gen 4. You know, when, when you're looking at material choices, you can go through that, that decision tree of what should I use and who should I use it on um, if you're um, if you're picking and choosing materials based on you know aesthetics and 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 feel and adjustability, Gen 4 is for you or for your patient. If you're picking it based on 
if the patient were to be, I call them an animal, they're just on their teeth all day long and they're clenching and they're grinding and they're really abusive to their teeth and historically have been, then you might want to actually use a, a zirconia restoration. Hybrid is happy to do those for you, but understand that there are the disadvantages that I've already talked about. Hope that helps. If anybody has any questions as it relates to um, tonight, uh, feel free to contact me, um, flamar at hybridimplants.com. Uh, happy to give you some information or refer you to somebody um, that has the information that you're looking for. Um, I always enjoy these. I like to share what we've done. By the time you get 30 years into your practice, there's nothing like sharing your experience. Um, so happy to do it. The question is, is when you were talking about the necessity of convexity against the tissue surface, I noticed that the prosthetic rolled back to the tissue, thus creating a potential ledge for food to collect. Do you experience that with your patients? So uh, the, the question relative to food trappage and food collecting, um, I, I can tell you the, the answer that I give uh, my, my own patients is when they say, they say, how long do these things last? I say, uh, they, it varies from patient to patient and therefore how you treat your case and how you, and what you put in your mouth and what you eat, and your habits and your parafunction will determine longevity. Um, I also say the same thing about when they ask the question, will food get trapped under my, uh, under my hybrid? I, I always say, absolutely. You know, any prosthetic restoration that you put in the mouth has a potential space. It has to, it has to have embrasures. It has to have, you know, it, it's not a saddle, uh, it's not a saddle restoration. And so with Cleansability and embrasures and health comes the potential for food, food entrapment. What I would say is there's like anything else, there's there's a fine line between acceptable and unacceptable. And patients generally don't complain about food entrapment as long as the contouring is done correctly by the laboratory. So I hope that answers that question.